second sermon on this text. We commonly make rule, many rules in religion and turn it into a laborious art full of intricate questions, precepts, and contentions. As there hath been a great deal of vanity in the conception of speculative divinity by a multitude of vain and unedifying questions which have no profit in them or are beneficial to them that are occupied therein, but only have stirred up strife and envy and raised the flame of contention in the Christian world. So I fear that practical divinity is no less vitiated and spoiled in this age amongst true Christians than the other among the schoolmen. Hereby it seems to me that Christ and his apostles did not suppose it to be so perplexed a business that we now do make it. Neither did the hearers weary themselves or others with so many various objections against the practices, practice of the fundamental commandment of the gospel, believing in Jesus Christ. The plain nature of the gospel being holden forth and received, I am persuaded was and is able, like the sun arising in brightness, to dispel and scatter all these mists and clouds which do arise both in the one and the other, from ignorance at first, and which are elevated to a greater height by the custom of the times. The matter, my brethren, is not so dark as you make it. Here it is plainly and simply expressed. This is the commandment that you believe in the name of his Son. And then, love one another. Ye all know that we had commandments given us by God, which were by nature impressed on the heart of man. But by his fall into sin, the tables of the law, which I may say were in Adam's mind and heart, understanding and affection, those two tables were broken in the fall, and since there could be no obedience because of ignorance and perversion, the tables breaking in pieces, their ruptures have produced these two opposite principles. The fall of man hath broken his mind, and so darkened his understanding, and broken his will, and put it on a wrong set, disappointed it, set it in a posture of enmity against God. However, we are by this fall utterly disabled to stand up before God in acceptable obedience. There is no man breathing, how blameless soever he be before the world, but must fall down as guilty before God in many things, yea, in all things. But the law, being thus obliterated out of men's consciences, as he lost ability to obey, so he, all, he lost almost all conscience of sin and disobedience. He, not knowing his charge and obligation, could not accuse himself for falling in rebellion. Therefore it pleased the Lord to cause a law to be written in the tables of stone in Mount Sinai. He transcribes the commandments over again that all the world may see their obligation and how infinitely short they have come in their subjection and how just their condemnation may be. For this purpose the Lord proclaims the old bond in the ears of men with great majesty and authority as it became the lawgiver that all may become guilty and stop their mouth before God. Romans 3.19 He would once have all men knowing that they are under infinite breaches of his commandments, that they may see themselves also subject to his judgment. Now, what do you think of a soul that stands at the foot of this mountain and hears a dreadful accusation read against it, to all which the conscience within must subscribe unto and both together pronounce the person guilty and liable to eternal punishment. I say, what can such a soul do who has with trembling heard his voice? Satisfaction there cannot be given for an infinite offense against an infinite nature curse and sentence which was the sanction and confirmation of this commandment is just 
And there appears no way how, without violation of God's justice, it can be repealed. Obedience to these commandments is now both impossible and unprofitable. Impossible, I say, because of the weakness and the wickedness of the flesh that has no ability nor willingness but to offend and disobey. And unprofitable because it cannot at all relax the former sentence of of condemnation. Now, obedience being a present duty cannot pay old debts nor satisfy our, for our former rebellions. And so it must have, it must leave a man to seen condemnation. I fear this is a puzzle that all consciences must come unto here or elsewhere. Here is a straight indeed. But yet, there is an enlargement. There is a way found out of bringing the soul out of the miry clay and deep pit of misery. And it is this. God had found out a ransom for himself without our procurement or consent or knowledge. He hath provided a satisfaction to this justice in his Son, Jesus Christ. Having laid upon him our iniquities, he exacts of him our deserved punishment and makes him a curse who knew no sin. Now this being done, the Lord sends forth to all poor sinners who are trembling at Mount Sinai this proclamation. This is my last and most peremptory command, that ye believe in the name of my Son, Jesus Christ. This is my well-beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Have ye heard me, the lawgiver, condemning you? Now go and hear him, the mediator and savior absolving you. For I have committed all judgment unto him. Though I pronounce the sentence in this world against you, yet I have committed all the execution of it to him. And if you come to him, you may prevent it. You have broken all my former commandments, and I have pronounced a sentence against you for that. But now I give a new commandment. Instead of all the former, which if you obey, then the sentence of death is relaxed. You who cannot obey the law and give satisfaction in your own persons, I charge you to flee unto my Son, Christ, who hath given me full satisfaction both to the curse by suffering and to the command by obedience. And lay hold on this his righteousness as your own. And in him, and in him, ye are justified. And delivered from all these sentences. And hard writings against you. I give a new commandment as the cure and remedy of all broken commandments. Believe on his name in which is salvation. Take his obedience and suffering for your cure and present me with that. I shall be as well satisfied as with your own personal satisfaction. This now is very plain business. All commands are broken. Yet there is one published in the gospel to help all. And it is 
in substance to embrace and welcome Jesus Christ for all. To seek our life and salvation in Him. To take Him as a priest. To offer sacrifice for us and expiate our sins. And to come to Him as a prophet. To seek wisdom and illumination. And all grace from Him. To choose Him as our King. Henceforth, to submit to his easy yoke of government. Now I say, there will be no more debates about this. Will ye yet dispute whether ye may believe or not? Will ye inquire after this whether you have a warrant or not? Truly, such a question would occasion much jealousy and provocation among men. If a man had signified as, if a man had signified as much willingness by command, by invitation, by request, by frequent repetition of these, yet to call and call and question or dispute whether or not I may go to such a person, will he make me welcome? Were it not the greatest affront I could put upon him? Would it not alienate his affection more than anything? to be jealous of his real kindness to me? I would desire to hold out unto you the sin, the danger, and the vanity of such a way. I say the sin is great. It is no less than the highest and most heinous disobedience to the gospel, which of all others is of the deepest dye. You have disobeyed the law and broken all the Ten Commandments. Will ye therefore disobey the Gospel too and break this fundamental commandment? Is it not enough that ye have broken the rest? And will ye break this also, which was given as the cure for all? Consider, I say, this is his commandment. Now, commands should be obeyed and not disputed, coming from an infallible and uncontrollable authority. Would you not silence all the rebellions of your hearts against the commands of praying, hearing, reading, dealing justly, walking soberly with this one word? It is his command. It is his sovereign will. And why do you not see the stamp of that same authority upon this? Now, if you consider it aright, it hath more authority upon it than upon others. Because it is his last command. And so, would be taken as most pungent and weighty. When your hearts rise up to question and dispute this matter, I pray you cut all these naughty objections with the sword of his commandment. You used to go about to loose them by particular answers and then tie them at leisure with art and skill. But truly, it would be a readier and wiser course to cut them in pieces at one stroke by this piercing and pungent precept. If your reasons and scruples be weighty and you cannot get answers to overbalance them, I pray you put this weighty seal of divine authority into the balance. And sure I am, it will weigh down all. Consider then the danger of it. It is the last and most peremptory command, after which you may expect no other but the execution of justice. How sad and severe is this certification. He that believeth not is condemned already, and the wrath of God abideth on him. There needs no new sentence to be pronounced against you. Why? Because if you believe not, that prior sentence of the law is yet standing above your heads to condemn you. That wrath abides on you. This is the only way to remove it. To come to him who hath taken it on himself after the breach of all commands. 
ye have this retreat, this refuge to flee unto, a new command to come to the Son and have life. But after this disobedience of the Son, you have none. There is nothing after unbelief, but you are turned over, or rather left over in the hand of the law and divine justice. Therefore, it is the most dangerous and damnable thing to disobey this. It is to refuse the very remedy of sin. Consider also what vanity and uselessness it is is in these debates. What an unreasonable and senseless thing it is to dispute against your own soul and against your own happiness. All is wrapped up here, and we do no less than the highest act of self-murder that can be. He that hateth me wrongs his own soul. What an unreasonable thing then it is, because ye are miserable to refuse mercy, because ye are unclean, Therefore, to maintain that you are not to come to the blessed fountain of cleansing. Because you have broken the rest of the commands. Therefore, you may not obey this. Is there any sense or reason in such things? Because I am a sinner, therefore I will not come to a Savior? Alas, to what purpose was the Son sent and given? And for what end came He? Was it not to seek and to save such as are lost and undone? And to deliver them from misery? What do you gain by such questions? For at length you must turn and enter in at the door of a naked command and promise. When you have wearied yourselves to find that in your hearts which is not in them. To seek waters in the wilderness and springs in the desert. Qualifications and graces in your own hearts to warrant your boldness in coming to the promise. I say... When you have sought, and all in vain, you must at length come to this fountain, in which is all grace and happiness. If you had just what you seek, yet, if you would indeed believe in Christ, you must deny them, and look upon yourselves as ungodly to be justified by faith. Why then do you grasp after that which can do you no good, though you had it? I mean, in point of your acceptation, consider it, my beloved, that the honor of God and your own happiness lies most in this. Nay, not only that, but your holiness too, which you pretend to seek after, lies in it. Till you come to Christ, it is vain to seek it elsewhere.